Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, preemptive like here and subscribe, even though I have not watched this channel yet, but a lot of subscribers and cool concept. Get your chef's hat on, everyone. Let's dive in. Let's do it. All right, original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send it right over there. Love to have you. My name is Connor. Uh, yeah, if, um, yeah, let's go. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door. Homex down the hall. Let's go. Or I guess it is Homex. Never mind. Stay. Today I thought it was about time for a return to form of curry. See what I did there? Yes, American. I'm going to that medieval cookbook which Radicate. I know and love so well, The Form of Curry, for a dish called maca. It's basically beans and fried onions. Good hearty peasant food. And that is exactly what we're going to be discussing today. So thank you to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video as we try to suss out what a medieval peasant might eat. This time on Tasting History. Now, if you've ever watched an episode of Tasting History where I cook from the form of curry, and I'll put a link up here to one of my favorites, you'll know that the recipes in the book were actually written for King Richard II, hardly a peasant. But the problem is, we don't have any recipes for peasants because nobody cared what they ate. True. But <laughs> we can look through the form of curry and find some recipes that would have the ingredients that might be available to peasants. Uh, so. That really narrows it down because almost every recipe in the book has a ton of spices and peasants would not have any spices. But this recipe for maca has only a few ingredients that will kind of have to change up. Otherwise, it's nice and simple, good peasant food. Maca. Take drawn beans and seed them well. Take them up of the water and cast them in a mortar. Grind them all to dust till they be white as any milk. Show for little red wine. Cast there among in the grinding, do there to salt, lesh it in dishes. Then take onions and mince them small and seed them in oil till they be all brown, and flourish the dishes therewith, and serve That's it pretty forth. Good. Wonderfully simple and frankly, a pretty good side dish for Thanksgiving if, like me, you insist on subjecting your family to medieval cooking. So what you'll need is three cups or 450 grams of beans, now, most of the beans that we use today would not have been available in medieval Europe. They're all New World beans. If you want to use something that is appropriate to the era, the closest thing that you're probably going to get are broad beans or fava beans. Guys, so we're, it's crazy. So are potatoes, tomatoes, uh, corn, uh, all those things that uh, Europe just didn't have until New World. That's crazy. Though, they're not going to be white like in the recipe. So no matter how much you grind them up, they're never going to be white. They're, they're more of a green, um, but those are going to be the closest thing. Fava beans. That said, Great I say use whatever bean makes you happy. A half cup to one cup of red wine or ale. Now here's one of the ingredients that we're going to swap out. The recipe calls for red wine, but in England, in the Middle Ages, Red wine, not really available to many peasants, so we're going to go with ale. You could also use mead, perhaps, if you want something sweeter. Also, the amount that you use is really up to you. It doesn't say... I, I don't quite know the differences between ale, mead... What are the others? Lager? I, I don't quite know the differences. Uh, so it's kind of how thick you want your bean dish. Salt to taste, an onion, minced, and then oil or butter for frying. So here's the other ingredient that we're going to swap out, because the oil in the recipe probably refers to olive oil, which King Richard would have been using, imported from Italy. Way too expensive for a peasant. But a peasant might be sharing a cow with their neighbor, or maybe even have a cow themselves, so they would have had plenty of butter. That said, the low smoke point of uh, butter going to be hard to fry onions in, not impossible, but you might want to add in a little bit of olive oil just to cheat. You could also use no lard, which many peasants would have as well. So first, take your beans and wash them, and then fill a pot with water and boil them. Now, depending on what bean you're going to use, they're going to have different consistencies. Fava beans kind of tend to disintegrate and just take up a lot of water. Uh, so the water pretty much all disappeared. I kept adding some, but it just would boil away and, or go into the beans. Um, and then the beans turned to mush. If you're using something a little bit uh, harder, like a red bean, then those will probably stay firm. That said, we're going to be mashing them up anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Once they're cooked, remove them from the pot and grind them up in a bowl. 
Then pour your wine or ale into a small saucepan and gently heat. Then pour it over the beans and mix it all together. Then mix in your salt and dish the beans into a bowl. And now for the onions, take a pan and put it over medium heat and then pour in your oil or melt your butter and then add the onions and fry them until brown. Now browning the onions can take between seven and 10 minutes. Uh, what would they have used for a skillet? Um, some sort of like clay or, or maybe, no, actually they might've just had a metal skillet. Add the onions and fry them until brown. Now browning the onions can take between seven Iron. and 10 minutes, which is perfect because I am just aching to tell you a bit about medieval peasant food. Now, people are always asking me, how do I do my research? And frankly, if I went through the process, I would bore you to tears. But I often start with a course on the Great Courses Plus. It's a subscription on-demand video learning service. Make sure you get your free trial. Use their link, Tasting History, here. The link down here helps them out. Service with lectures on every subject you could possibly think of, not guilt. just food and history. And the teachers teaching the courses are truly world class. It was actually where I was first introduced to Ken Albala, who is an amazing food history instructor. And he has a course called Cooking Across the Ages, which is a fantastic place to start. So if like me, you have a lifelong love of learning, go visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash tasting history. Link in the description to start your free trial today. It's also going to make a great Hanukkah or Christmas gift, I would think. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, let's get back to medieval peasants. Oh, he knows Actually, December is the advertiser month. Okay. Before we delve into what a medieval peasant might eat, let us turn to that 14th century chronicler Jean Foissart to see what a medieval peasant or serf actually was. It is the custom in England, as in other countries, for the nobility to have great power over the common people who are their serfs. This means that they are bound by law and custom to plow the fields of their masters, harvest the corn, gather it into barns, and thresh and winnow the grain. They must also mow and carry home the hay, cut and collect wood, and perform all manner of tasks of this kind. So yeah, today we are talking about the bottom rung of society, and that is fine. The problem is that if you're busy winnowing your lord's grain, that didn't really sound right, then you don't have time to, to log everything that you're eating. It was long before Instagram. So we don't have any recipes, but we can still extrapolate from other writings and other recipes of the day, as well as archeology, span what they would have eaten. Also, medieval peasants are not a monolith, and nor was their diet, because the medieval period covers up, up to a thousand years, depending on who you talk to. Things are going to change in that time. Also, the, the space that we're talking about, all of Europe, it's huge. People in Italy are going to be eating differently than people in England or the Holy Roman Empire or Russia. So take True. everything in this episode with a grain of salt, which is a perfect place to Fun. start. See, a lot of people think that salt was really expensive during the Middle Ages, and that could be true. But it could also not be true. It really depended on where you were. See, most of the sources of salt in medieval Europe were either inland salt springs or the ocean. So if you lived on the coast, getting salt wasn't going to be that hard or expensive because you could just evaporate your own. That said, Separating salt from sand actually takes a lot of, of work, so you might have some sand in your salt, but True. you know, at least you have salt. Right. That said, most people weren't using it to spice their food, but rather to preserve their food, so a little sand ain't gonna kill you. But if you were looking for flavor, then you might have some salt, but you weren't going to have any of the spices that the wealthy people had. Instead, you would probably rely on herbs, which you could grow in your own garden attached to your cottage, called a potager. They would grow all sorts of herbs in these gardens, from sorrel and sage and mint and rosemary and thyme, and frankly, a lot more herbs than we would use today. And one that they grew, which technically isn't an herb, but they treated it as such, was garlic. And for most of the period, it was associated with the poor. There's actually a wonderful quote from the garlic 15th century, rather snooty Italian author, Sabadino degli Arienti, where he says, garlic is always a rustic food, but at times is artificially made elegant if placed in the cavity of a roasted duck. Artificially made elegant. What a snob. 
anyway, like garlic, which is technically a vegetable, they would also grow other vegetables. Carrots and cabbage and beans and peas and leeks and onions. onions. And if they were really lucky, they might even have a couple fruit trees or wild berries. Though some fruits were actually kind of kept away from the peasantry and were rather prized, depending on where you were in Europe. Peaches, for example. In Le Poritani, by the same author who talked about the garlic, he gives a wonderful story about a peasant and he gets caught she for stealing like and eating a peach that was meant to be for the local knight. And he actually blames it on a donkey, but the knight does not believe him and beats him mercilessly. It's kind of sad, actually. But it was rather common. See, punishing peasants for the poaching of prized provisions was Jeez. rather a popular pastime for the posh. The laws varied wildly throughout Europe, but in Norman England, they had something called forest law. All hunting in the Silva Regis or Kingswood, which is basically all of the good forestry where there was game animal, was forbidden to actually anyone except for the king unless he gave a special dispensation, which he could probably, you know, often give to those friends that he had. But if you didn't have Lord in front of your name, you weren't going to be having any boar or venison or pheasant anytime soon. And if you were caught poaching one of these animals, then the punishment could be rather severe. It could be as innocuous as castration or losing a hand or maybe blinding, what? but then it could all be as innocuous as castration. What is he holding? Jesus Christ! Castration or losing a hand or maybe blinding, but then it could also be death. And there are stories, though I wasn't able to find any contemporary sources, but there are stories that in parts of what's now Germany, it was practiced to take the skin of whatever animal had been killed and wrap it around the person and then set dogs on them to kill them. Very I thought they were gonna skin the person for a second. Like Game of Thrones, Ramsey Bolton. I, I've not seen Game of Thrones, so I, I don't get that that reference. Possibly not true, but who knows? So it's no surprise that the poor tended to get their protein from eggs and dairy. And one of the things that they ate a lot of was something called green cheese, which was an unaged cheese that no wealthy person would be caught eating, but the poor tended to, uh, tended to like it because it didn't take a lot of time to make. And actually my very first episode of Tasting History was on making this green cheese. Ah, memories. Now, peasants did eat yeah, some meat. Out. Some animals were raised and there was some hunting allowed. Hedgehogs, rabbits, small birds. Sorry about construction, guys. Badgers, and of course, the occasional pig, because pigs were everywhere in medieval Europe, especially in England, because they kept the streets clean. There were actually pigs in London during the 14th and 15th century called St. Anthony's pigs, who roamed the city wearing bells around their necks. It was actually considered Hey guys, sorry, you're gonna have to deal with some construction sounds, all right? That's no problem though. Let's do it. Meat. Some animals were raised and there was some hunting allowed. Hedgehogs, rabbits, small birds, badgers, and of course the occasional pig, because pigs were everywhere in medieval Europe, especially in England, because they kept the streets clean. There were actually pigs in London during the 14th and 15th century called St. Anthony's pigs, who roamed the city wearing bells around their necks. It was actually considered an act of charity to feed those pigs, and then when the pigs got fat enough, they would either be sold or slaughtered and given to the poor. Now, if you weren't lucky enough to have a pig, then another great source of protein was fish. They had a lot of it, depending again on where, where you, you live. lived. If you lived near a river, you could catch salmon or trout or beaver. Yes, beaver was a fish, and I discussed that in my episode on Lenten what? foods. There were a lot of weird foods that were considered fish, including puffins. So if you live near the coast, you could have a puffin or eel or crab or any of the fish that come from the sea, except no porpoises and no whales, which were also considered fish, because there were laws where only the king got to eat those. In fact, there were actually a lot of laws on fishing, just as there were laws on forestry. Can I just say, I, 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 more I, I know it's, you know, it's medieval, it's, it's, but I, I can't just... People are, are, people suck sometimes. <laughs> and I don't just mean like, I'm, I'm not talking about like individual, some people are awful. I just mean like people. Like, 
whether it was you or me, if we were a peasant, we would be complaining about it. If we were a royalty or whatever, I'm sure we would be doing it. And it's just how, like, when you have power, it's just like, yeah, you can't have that. No, that... You can't have that. That... I want that one. You can have that. I don't really like those. You can have that. That. I want that. And it's just... And also, did they go, like, oysters and clams... I feel like if I was, like, stuck outside near a beach with no food, that would be, like, the first thing I would think of. It's like, oh, clams are really easy to get. Something like that. Um, and, and that was a great source of protein for peasants. But there was one great equalizer in the diets of both the rich and poor alike of medieval Europe, and that was carbs, most often in the form of either a thickener for pottages or as bread. The quality of bread, of course, varied wildly. While the wealthy might be dining on wastel and rastons made of fine white wheat flour, the poor would be having barley and oats and rye and maslin. But when times were tough, and times were often tough, they would make horse bread, which was made of dried peas horse. and beans and whatever else you could find. Oh. Oddly enough, one of the good things that came out of the Black Death in the mid-14th century was the... Whenever you stop at these things and you look a little bit closer, there's always stuff. So, you got an undead army over there. Classic. You got a skeleton on the rock. Pulling a guy's head off. Or at least dragging him down. You have this guy playing the bongos. Having a good time. They are corralling people into... Something. Yikes. Okay. Increase. Yikes. Someone in that. Okay. Availability of wheat to the masses. Sorry, I'm and an three, idiot. Oddly enough, one of the good things that came out of the Black Death in the mid 14th century was the increased availability of wheat to the masses. In 1394, a plowman in Lincolnshire received 15 loaves a week as payment, seven of which had to be made of wheat. Now, the last and perhaps best way to get your calories through carbs was to drink them. And at least in Northern Europe, that typically I'm meant sorry, but either ale or mead. Did you say, like, the one good thing about the plague is that everyone died? <laughs> is that so many people died that stuff is cheaper? Because with every meal, you'd have a bit of ale or mead unless you were drinking water. And yes, they did drink water in the Middle Ages, despite what you may have been told. But... They also drank a lot of mead and ale because you didn't need to worry if it was clean or not. Had alcohol and it killed everything. Though many of the ales at the time were called small ales, which were much lower in alcohol because the purpose was not to get drunk, it was simply to have something safe to drink. Now the further south you go in Europe, not to get That is a picture that is timeless. Get drunk, it was simply to have something safe to drink. Now, the further south you go in Europe, the more likely wine becomes the drink of choice, even for the peasants. But in England, not so. And frankly, that might be for the best, because it seems that even then, just like today, France kept the good stuff for themselves and shipped the swill abroad. Around 1175, on visiting the English court of King Henry II, Peter of Blois lamented, the wine is turned sour and moldy, thick, greasy, stale, flat, and smacking of pitch. I have sometimes seen even great lords served with wine so muddy that a man must needs close his eyes and clench his teeth, wry-mouthed and shuddering, and filtering the stuff rather than drinking. And that is why I swapped out wine for ale today in our recipe. Speaking of which, it should be about ready. So once your onions are nicely browned, you can do as the form of curry commands and flourish the dish therewith. Then serve it forth. And here we are. Maca, or beans and onions. Let's give it a try. I'm going to get lots of onions because I like grilled onions. Me too. Onions are good. It's very hearty. Honestly, this could be a whole freaking meal. Um, it's just like a bunch of beans. It's, it's very simple. It's not flavorless by any means, but it's very simple. That said, I wouldn't fault you for, for throwing in some other spices or herbs or something. To, no, you to need the real experience. The flavor, but if you like onions especially, just add more onions. That's what I'm going to do, because uh, they really kind of give that wonderful, sweet, caramelized onion flavor to it. But it's good. 
It's not amazing, but you what know, you it's peasant food. This alongside a piece of salmon, ah, it'd be lovely. I True. put that at Whole Foods. Now, if you enjoyed this video, let me know because maybe I could do a whole like mini series. I could cover the foods of medieval monks and the medieval really tradesmen cool concept and for a channel. what a knight might eat during the Middle Ages. I saw that one. I haven't. Let me know in the comments. I, I saw the thumbnail. I haven't seen it. What a knight might eat during the Middle Ages. If you'd be interested, let me know in the comments. So make sure to click the link in the description for your great courses plus free trial, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. Really cool video, uh, video and cool channel. Um, I love it. Secret foods of the Spanish Inquisition, best of medieval and renaissance recipes. There was a night one I saw. Really nice. Bell icon. Uh, he seems like a nice guy, too. Alrighty. Yeah, it was really cool. See you guys next time. It is Sunday, right? Sunday, February 20th. See you guys.